This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. When I started this show, I wanted it to be unlike any other. I wanted to talk with people about big ideas, but also about themselves in ways they never had before in public. So far, that's exactly what's happened in every episode. But I couldn't have that kind of conversation by talking to someone on Skype or on the phone. They have to be talking to me face to face in person. And that means I have to travel and find recording spaces where I can have intimate conversations like that. All of which is to say, I need your help to keep this show going. Please do me a favor. Go to unregisteredlisteners.com and become a subscriber. This isn't just a contribution. You'll become a member of a private Facebook group where you can talk with me and with guests from the show. You'll also receive access to the episodes that have been archived, which right now include the episodes with Michael Malice, Maggie McNeil, and Camille Foster. We're also rolling out unregistered merchandise, shirts, mugs, stickers, and other items featuring the unregistered and renegade university artwork. Subscribers get free or heavily discounted merchandise there. There's much more for subscribers at unregisteredlisteners.com. I hope you can help me keep these remarkable conversations going. There's another way you can participate in conversations with me like the ones on the podcast, and it's happening soon. There are a few tickets left for a special weekend event with me in Salem, Massachusetts on August 5th and 6th. During the weekend, we'll discuss many of the issues that I've talked about on the podcast, including the meaning of the Trump presidency, the current crises in colleges and universities, the politics of race, and the idea and theories that inform my work. And during the weekend, we will record a live episode of Unregistered. You can get all the information for this event and purchase tickets by going to thaddeusrussell.com slash courses. Until I came across the work of my guest this week and her organization, I had no idea that North Koreans are the most renegade people on the planet. Hannah Song, who is the president of Liberty in North Korea, wants you to know that the people we think of as helpless prisoners of the Kim dictatorship not only will win their freedom, but that they're doing it every single day. So everybody knows about North Korea, or I should say, everybody knows about the North Korean government. Everybody knows about the totalitarian regime there. Everybody's heard of Kim Jong-un and how crazy he is. Everybody has heard about his missile tests and the possibility of him having nuclear weapons. Everybody hears about these things almost every day, especially these days. Here's what no one knows about. The people of North Korea. And so about two years ago, I stumbled across this organization based in Long Beach, California, called Liberty in North Korea. And that was their only focus, actually, was the people of North Korea and what they were doing. What are the people of North Korea doing, was their question. And the answer they've come up with is pretty remarkable. They have found that the people in North Korea for about two decades now are doing something that has liberated millions of people around the globe and might be doing the same thing in North Korea. But no Americans have heard of this. No Americans know about this. So I'm sitting with the president of that organization, Hannah Song, and I just want to say, I, I, when I started this podcast, I didn't think I would have any NGOs on. I, I don't really like NGOs, generally speaking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like 
sort of the lobbying world and having to beg for politicians to do favors for you or enact policies, most of which, the vast majority of which, especially in foreign policy, I don't like. I also don't like that NGOs tend to censor themselves because they're afraid of saying things that will piss off donors or the politicians they are currying favor with. And for two years now, I've been following Link. I've been following you and been looking for things that I don't like. I'm waiting for things, waiting to see things that I don't like. And so far, I haven't found anything. What you guys are doing is remarkable, unique, and it is as close to my own work on foreign policy and foreign relations and social change, really, as anything I have ever seen. I mean that. So I, you're the NGO I want to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, just, I just want to say that at the outset. Yeah, I'm being honest here. I just really, really love what you're doing. So Hannah, <laughs> tell us, summarize what the people of North Korea have been doing that matters, that no one knows about. What, what is it that Americans don't know about what's going on among the ordinary people of North Korea? Wow. There's a lot that Americans, I think, probably don't know about what the everyday North Korean person is doing and how they're living inside of that country. Uh, that really goes beyond what I think the media shows us oftentimes. Well, like you said, it's been about two decades now since we've started to see a lot of this pretty significant social information and economic change happening. Uh, and a lot of that has really been happening at a grassroots level inside North Korea. It's being driven by the North Korean people. And I think for us to really understand that, we have to look back at the famine from the 1990s, the mid to late 1990s that happened, and how that really sort of catalyzed a lot of these changes. But in general, um, when we look at North Korea, it usually seems like this really impossible unchanging issue. And that's probably because of how North Korea is framed in the media, how we learn and see about it, you know, especially from the level of high politics. With every changing administration, with every changing policy, with every changing leader um, in North Korea, it just sometimes seems like this very hopeless future um, in general, with very little hope for progress. But when we actually drill down and, like you said, look at the ground level and what is actually changing, what we found is that the North Korean people are absolutely incredible, and they have found the most incredible ways to overcome these challenges and are forging progress, actually. So let's start with the famine that happened in the mid to late 1990s. It was a collapse of the state socialist economy. Um, a lot of the aid and trade and support that the North Korean government was receiving, um, and especially that was because of the collapse of communism that happened around mm -hmm. that time, in addition to a confluence of other factors. So they were getting a lot of aid from the Soviet Union in particular, right? Soviet Union, yes. Um, other countries as well. And, you know, longstanding partner has also been China for right. a very so long time. When the Soviet Union ceases to exist, the aid that was propping up the North Korean regime, or much of the North Korean regime, also ceased to exist. Yes. Which, which, a, yeah, which meant a, for the people, very bad, very, right. very very bad time. Very bad time. And in addition to that, you know, North Korea, the peninsula of Korea, um, when it was divided, most of the arable land was actually in the south. It is in the south, um, whereas most of the natural resources are actually in the north. Hmm. In a way, it would it would kind of always have been impossible anyway from a farming perspective. I didn't know that. To, yeah, for hmm. the North Korean people um, to really have been able to sustain themselves anyway. But hmm. what you saw happening was it was very difficult at that time because of a lot of different natural disasters as well as the government prioritizing any aid and assistance it was getting anyhow to the military. Um, the policy, the Songun policy, which meant military first, meant that um, that type of support would go primarily to the military. It was going to the elite. That was the priority of the government in terms of the distribution of aid um, in that country. And so what you see happening is a population of 24 million people who relied on the government for assistance. They had a public distribution system. And in effect, everyone essentially worked, worked for the state. And you go and work for the state. You get rations, you get your food distributed from the public distribution system. And when you start showing up and there's nothing there anymore, it's sort of this process where people have been used to relying on the government for everything for so long. And one thing that I think we forget too, and this is important to note because right after the, the Korean War, after the peninsula was divided, because of a lot of the assistance that the North Korean government was receiving from a lot of its partners, 
North Korea actually developed even quicker than South Korea did. So you really saw North Korea sort of thriving at that time. And you saw this period where if you talk to the, our parents' generation, for example, they have a pretty nostalgic view of Kim Il-sung because during that time, things were, were going well. You know, you had housing and education and you had all of these provisions being met. You saw North Korea growing and developing, uh, again, at a faster rate than South Korea was. And then you saw all of that sort of flip-flop and switch. Um, and then you saw North Korea, uh, South Korea, sorry, just develop so quickly. It's sort of what South Korea is known for today, right? It's mm -hmm. developing the quickest in the shortest period of, mm -hmm. of time. And so that's important to note because when we talk about how this young generation in North Korea views the government as opposed to their parents' generation, that's an important reason why their parents' generation still have this sort of nostalgic view of Kim Il Sung and of the system at that time. And so during the the famine, you know, you have all of a sudden people who have been so used to getting rations and getting what they need from the government and it doesn't exist anymore there's no more food let's be specific about what this famine meant how many people died what's the estimate estimates are all over the board mm -hmm. we like to say that up to a million north korean people starved to death mm -hmm. during this famine yeah i mean it was certainly in the hundreds of thousands i don't think anyone disputes that hundreds of thousands up to three million actually are yeah. what some groups have estimated and we have lots of testimony i think of north koreans who have left saying that they saw bodies lying in fields like during in a war zone right absolutely Just lining the streets it, you know any north korean person during that time can talk about watching family members starve to death noticing in school classmates sort of disappearing. They just stopped showing up. It's interesting because there's this gap of education for a lot of young people who grew up during the famine because kids were so hungry. They either canceled school, they just stopped going to school. Education was disrupted. That's a key part of the story here. Yeah. That, that kids, a lot of kids stopped going to school. Right. right? And, you know, I think one of the, the really tragic things was, you know, one of the young North Koreans, one of the first North Koreans we helped to bring here to the U.S., his name is Joseph Kim. He actually wrote a book, Under the Same Sky. And in the book, he actually talks about and, and goes in detail about watching his father starve to death, what it was like to see him slowly withering away, to see his father sacrificing his own food for him so that he could, you know, he was a, a young boy at that time so that he wouldn't have to suffer through that. Even through the point of his father knowing he was going to starve to death and, and telling his son, this is how you know when someone has died. You know, it's, it's like placing your finger under the small of the back and if it's completely to the ground, you know that the body is lifeless. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he talks about just seeing his father starve to death and also seeing people in the streets. Joseph effectively lost his father to the famine, um, to starvation. His mother then took his sister to China to try to find food, only to find out that his mom actually sold his sister. And then um, his mom was caught doing some cross-border activities and then was put into a prison. Mm -hmm. And he was orphaned and homeless and, and living on the streets. And so Joseph's story, unfortunately, is definitely representative of a number of young people his age during that time and what they went through as a result of this famine. Mm -hmm. And so there's the other side of that story, right? Joseph's family... They weren't able to adapt. They didn't adapt well to the situation. His father starved to death, succumbed to the famine. Whereas there were other people who, during that time period, realized that they needed to take matters into their own hands. And what you started to see happening is people really beginning to start to sell and barter goods, make their way across the border into China. And it's important to note, it's illegal to leave North Korea without state permission. So as a North Korean at that time, people were really desperate. The border was much more porous. And in the border of North Korea, China, there are bunkers on the North Korean side with, with border guards that are there watching to make sure that people are not escaping, going across. Same thing on the Chinese side. And obviously, more recently, it's much more heavily fortified. But 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was much more porous. Even the guards on the border were hungry and starving. So from what we heard from North Koreans, they could bribe their way across the border easily by promising a pack of cigarettes or some food when they come back to these border guards. And so North Koreans were able to cross the border, go into China, and they were able to get goods, bring them back across the border. It was just this very informal way that people began to try to find a way to survive. And so the really interesting thing was that actually when we look at how this sort of, you can say, grassroots marketization really began to proliferate in North Korea, 
it was really more of just a survival mechanism for people. It wasn't anything beyond that, but just simply needing to find a way to survive and people realizing that they had to really figure it out on their own, find their own food or find their own means, find people to trade with, to barter with, you know, engage in black market activities in order to, to survive and to, per, to feed their family members, um, things like that. And so that was really the beginning of this sort of grassroots marketization and what we saw. And then over the years, that's only increased, particularly as the government was never really able to go back to providing the level of rations that they once had. And so I think in a recent survey that was done with defectors, it said today it's only about 6% maybe of defectors that they had interviewed still rely on that type of support from the system, whereas probably the vast majority of people are now engaged in some sort of market activity. And a lot of defectors that we have interviewed and talked to say if... There's no way to really survive outside of the markets anymore. But that being said, how the markets have proliferated, how they've grown is incredible. Today, you know, and this is what one of the young women said, there's nothing you can't buy in the North Korean market except for cat's horns. And that's because that doesn't exist. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and so... It mm. really goes to show you, and when you look at some of this undercover footage that's been smuggled out of North Korea, what's in the markets, it's incredible. You see all types of products. You see a lot of Chinese products in the markets there. You know, you see all of these different things. And then we hear so many anecdotes from um, North Koreans who talk about code words they're using in the market, you know, when they're selling goods. Uh, there was a young woman who used to sell makeup in the markets and she had the stuff that was okay to be selling in the markets that was more chinese brands or even just north korean approved types of brands and then under the table sort of hidden away was the smuggled south korean makeup which was really the best quality yep. the stuff everybody wants yep. but you can't go around you know in the markets saying hey i have south korean makeup here come to my stall now, i don't know if you've ever been to these stalls in south korea for example Example, they're very similar to what I imagine it's like in North Korea. I have not had a chance to go to the markets in North Korea myself yet. But what you see in these videos, and, and again, just from my own experiences, to being in these markets in South Korea, for example, it's just stalls. And this is probably like anywhere else in the world. Stalls of people selling goods, screaming at passerby, trying to get them to stop at their stall to check out their merchandise. So you need a, a differentiating factor to get someone to stop at your stall. Mm-hmm. And so what she said was for her stall, she needed to figure out a way to kind of cue people into the fact that she had this, this really great high quality South Korean makeup that, you know, she couldn't just shout from her stall. And so she used a South Korean accent and she started to just kind of from her stall, just started saying, Hey, come check out my makeup, come check <laughs> out my goods, but it's in a South Korean accent. And so for North Koreans, it sounds a little bit strange, but if you've seen these illegal South Korean dramas, like soap operas, soap operas on these, TV, they are. So they're South Korean dramas that are on TV in South Korea okay. that are getting smuggled into North Korea right. completely illegally um, onto USB drives, onto DVDs. And it has become very popular in North Korea. And so it's illegal, though. It's illegal to watch foreign media. The mm-hmm. only approved media is obviously North Korean media. Although you can really only look at Kim Jong-un looking at things so, for so long, right? Yeah. But, you know, so especially young people, they love watching the South Korean media if they can get their hands on it. They love watching foreign media, Hollywood media, mm-hmm. um, these movies. But South Korean media in particular is interesting to them because it's people speaking the same language or similar, very similar language. And it's so interesting to them. This is how the other half of the peninsula lives. And so there's a lot of thoughts around that, too. You know, some North Koreans who think it's just propaganda it can't be real. Mm-hmm. Like this, what they're seeing is actually right. South Korea. And then others who, after watching it for a long enough period of time start to realize that that might actually be really what South Korea looks like. But as young people are watching this and as people watch that, you know, you start to pick up on the accents. You start to notice they dress differently. You start to pick up on the hairstyles and the fashion and all that stuff. And so, you know, what this young woman was doing was using that accent to try to cue to people secretly 
that if you watch South Korean foreign media, you'll recognize this accent mm -hmm. and you'll come to my stall. Mm -hmm. And so she was saying they would come over and they would use this kind of code language. And so there's this um, like expression, they would say, so that means like the, the neighborhood up there and the neighborhood down there hmm. kind of, you know. Uptown, downtown. Kind of, yeah, like that. And so that's kind of code for, do you have anything from like downtown uh -huh. sort of, uh, and then, you know, would pull out those types of goods. And hmm. so those types of tactics, it was just so interesting and fascinating to hear about how how entrepreneurial and smart some of these young people were, especially in how they were engaging in their market activities. But again, how all of these things really play into each other. Yeah. Um, so, um, so you've already done something you're not supposed to do as an NGO working in the foreign policy field. You started with a story about Joseph and mm -hmm. how awful it was for his family and how oppressive the regime was during the 90s and up to the 90s too. So that's where everybody every NGO starts their narrative mm -hmm. in foreign policy. And they've been doing it for in this country for about 150 years. So if you look at every single war, the United mm -hmm. States, every single military engagement the United States has ever had over the last mm -hmm. 150 years, every single one, they began with a story like that. Mm -hmm. So in Cuba, there was in all these stories about women being raped by Spanish soldiers. Next thing we know, we have the invasion of Cuba and the Spanish American War. World War I, the Kaiser is doing these horrible things to the German people, so we must invade. World War II, it's a, it goes on and on and on. And so today I see this all the time, and usually it's this is what humanitarian interventionists do. But I'd say actually it's really all interventionists in the history of this country start their story the way you did with some horror story about mm -hmm. something that's going on in another country across the world. And therefore, mm -hmm. then they say, therefore, we are obligated mm -hmm. as humane, moral people mm -hmm. to do something about it. It's up to us mm -hmm. to go right that wrong, to save those people, to help them. Right. Now, sometimes that means sending food, but usually, often, I would say, it ends up with people in boots with big guns and tanks and mm -hmm. shooting and killing. So you don't even go to the humanitarian aid part. You go immediately after telling the story about the horrors of the North Korean regime and this one man's particularly devastating story you go immediately not to what the United States should do or what we should do in America. You keep talking about them, the North Koreans themselves, and not even the government, and about what they are doing for themselves and have been doing for themselves. And that's kind of your whole story. I don't think I've ever seen that in this field. If, it, if it's out there, it's pretty rare. And this is why, this is why I'm here talking to you, because <laughs> that's what I'm about. I love that it's not asking me, really, to do anything. <laughs> and that's that's not it's not that I don't care it's that it's not for me to solve it's not for Americans to solve mm -hmm. you're also showing with real evidence that these people can and are mm -hmm. saving themselves or making their lives better so it's it's really remarkable what you're doing and well it's it's really remarkable what they're doing and it's yeah. and I'm really glad that you're you're showing this to us um so I was just listening to a podcast with Mark Bowden I think he just wrote a big article about North Korea and what we should do about North Korea and he laid out the options for what America should do about North Korea mm -hmm. So option number one, full-scale assault, wipe out the North Korean regime, conquer, invade, colonize, essentially, is option number one. Okay, so the foreign policy establishment in the United States is not too keen on that for various reasons. That's good. <laughs> number, option number two is um, surgical strike. You decapitate the regime. You send in special ops or you send in a drone and you assassinate Kim Jong-un. Well, there's actually apparently, according to Bowden, there are some people in the United States military right now as we speak who favor that option, although it's not a majority, thank God. And then the third option that was laid out by Bowden is that we should, I think he put it, we should get used to it. We should accommodate. We should just accept it. We should accept the North Korean regime for what it is, and it's going to be around. The assumption underneath this, of course, is that it will be around forever, at least the, the foreseeable future. And as far as I understand his argument, it's not going to change. So what is happening in North Korea is essentially not going to change. The Kim family will continue to rule it. They will continue to be homicidal maniacs. And we need to just accept that. Well, guess what, guys? If you looked beneath the surface, 
If you looked below the government or the governments and their interactions, you're going to find this whole world of how many people is it? 20, how many million people? 24, 25 20, million. 25 million people mm -hmm. who ain't Kim Jong-un who are doing all kinds of things that are completely contrary to what he wants, to what the regime requires, mm -hmm. just in their actions. And here's the other great thing about this. And, but I've seen this in many, many countries over many, many decades. As a historian, I've seen this happen. There are, as far as we know, there has not been a, an organized, explicitly political resistance movement inside North Korea, right? I mean, everyone agrees on that. There's no evidence of anything like that. People marching with signs and, or even giving speeches, or right? There's not, none of that. There's no civil society. There's just none. none. I mean, there's just no evidence of any, any organized political, as we think of it, political Can't. resistance. Well, I mean, that's happened in other totalitarian regimes, but, you know, it's just... The repression in North Korea? Yeah. Any form of dissent is quashed sure. so quickly. There have been small things, yeah. I mean, like small yeah. things, like you mentioned. I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> I, absolutely well, not. And here's the thing. I wouldn't recommend it for two reasons. One is that you'll probably get killed or imprisoned. But secondly, and maybe more importantly... You don't even need to, that it's going to be way less effective than simply buying a South Korean soap opera at the black market on the border and going home, make sure you go home and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all you got to do. And apparently that's about 80 to 90 percent of North Koreans have done that. Something like that. Right. There's a at this point. Right. It's a huge percentage have yeah. had some experience with the black market, have had some interaction with foreign goods, in particular foreign media, mm -hmm. not just South Korean, but American media mm -hmm. and European media, Japanese media and all that, right? So just doing that mm -hmm. is the greatest threat mm -hmm. to that regime. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean it will topple and be removed mm -hmm. necessarily anytime soon, but what's happening apparently from one extent from your work and other people's work on this is that it's being sort of hollowed out from inside. So mm -hmm. Kim and maybe his son, whoever, will be the ruler for the next five or 10 years, possibly, and they'll still, the, the regime will still look essentially the same, but that the ways in which people are living under the regime are going to be, ra they already are radically different from 10 or 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And it's every, almost every single day. Well, no, it is every single day. It's changing even more, becoming more free, more prosperous on the ground, and people are enjoying their lives more and more and more and more. They're literally looking different because they're dressing according to the fashions outside North Korea that they find out about from watching TV. These smuggled, they smuggle these TV shows in on USB sticks, right, and SD cards across the border from China, and then they look at the stuff and then they imitate it. In terms of how people actually live, that's how change is being made there. It's not about the government at all. It's not about what we are doing for them. They're doing it for themselves. Absolutely. I think that's the most important part of the narrative is how the North Korean people are finding ways to overcome those historical challenges and even new challenges that continue to be put in front of them. You know, the North Korean government, a lot of people will say that Kim Jong-un is, is crazy, is erratic, but... Uh, Unfortunately, I think actually the North Korean government is very strategic. Mm -hmm. They're very smart. Yep. And um, they are perpetually finding ways to try to push back on some of these changes that they're not excited about, you could say. <laughs> you know, a lot of the, the erosion, the ideological erosion that's happening right now. Let's take a step back. So North, how has North Korea lasted this long? How has North Korea lasted great, in the state that it's question. in right now yes. for so long? Right. Because no other totalitarian regime has managed to do it as well and as long as North Korea has. You know, fundamentally, North Korea has, and this is what you touched on before, it is extremely closed off and extremely repressive. And so that's essentially the probably the two most important pillars in terms of how it's maintained for so long. So when we talk about the repression in North Korea, you're talking about a, a country where it's really crazy, but we have to understand that they have been able to essentially control and keep 24, 25 million people completely isolated from the outside yeah, world there's no internet. for decades. There's no internet at all. So there's internet, but for only very select elite right. few government. foreigners, government yeah. people, Hackers, people who have access that for a explicit reason, right. but your everyday North Korean person doesn't even know what the internet is. Mm -hmm. And so you have a country where 
domestic cell phones were only reintroduced in 2009, I believe it was. So it hasn't even been that long. There's about 3 million subscribers to hmm. the domestic cell phone network wow. in the country. And they're very expensive. Oh, but that's, have, con- but that's controlled by the government? Yeah, it's it's okay. all it's it's only you know it's only domestic cell phone usage. You have to register your phones. It's oh. probably very likely that. But I guess they can't control doing. what you say on the phone, or can well, they? Do they monitor? The assumption it? is that they're monitoring. Are they able to do that with cell phones? Yeah. Really? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Oh, absolutely. See, it just seems difficult technologically, but I don't know. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. And so you know you have a country from a technological perspective that is very late to the game. You can <laughs> yeah. say, um, and so. You know, high tech in North Korea would be like, you know, they they do have laptops and they do. But again, it's really when you look at technology and who has access to it, it's people with money or with power. Um, And well, or those who are willing to smuggle it across the border, people who are willing to smuggle it across the border and that have it. And it's again, so many interesting anecdotes around who within your town may have a laptop and everybody goes to them to get the USB copied or to Mm -hmm. transfer over files or that kind of thing. But. Um, you know, again, North Korea has been so closed off, and the most important reason why is because by isolating the people, by completely shutting them off from the outside world, the North Korean government has been able to create the ideas, the ideology, the information, the narrative that they wanted people to believe about the country itself, about their government, about the outside world. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so for decades, the North Korean people were in the dark. There was, they were heavily indoctrinated from a very young age in school. Their version of history is completely skewed. That's one of the biggest challenges, for example, you know, from when you think about North Koreans, when they finally defect and they resettle, as they get to, let's say, they resettle in South Korea, they have to relearn history, effectively, mm-hmm. in terms of what they were taught about their own country and about the world around them. This is really important because of that, because of how isolated and closed off the country has been for so long. That's why the North Korean government was able to tell the people the narrative they wanted them to believe. Uh, And so it's important to note that even though we talk about a lot of these really interesting changes that are happening and have been happening for two decades, it's certainly not all pervasive. Mm -hmm. It's not happening at an equal rate across the country. Um, it never does in a non-democratic country. And it's also generational. You, it's generational. You, you mentioned that earlier, Absolutely. right? That the older people still largely, it sounds like, are still loyal generally to the ruling family. Is that right? Um, I would say, you know, I think that's it's hard to, I wouldn't say that it's that they're all generally loyal. There's definitely a difference in the way that they do think about the state or the government. And again, that really just depends too. Mm-hmm. Um, where people live really matters. Um, in some yeah, of the research that we've done, yeah. my colleague Sokil Park has done a lot of kind of identifying where in North Korea these sort of hot spots of change are, that we believe change is happening at a faster rate. Uh, and for key reasons, they're closer to the border, you have a higher rate of defections that have happened from there and as a result more inputs from the outside world as defectors are keeping in touch with their family members and sending money and money and information inside the country Mm -hmm. so you know for whatever these different reasons are there are different places and 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 hot spots within north korea where this type of change is happening faster and so the mentality the thinking is also going to be different in these areas also aren't the hot spots where this is happening, uh, don't they tend to be outside of Pyongyang? Well, one of the hotspots, you know, so Kiel has identified Pyongyang would be one of the hotspots as well, but for different reasons. Mm-hmm. You know, because of the amount of change that is happening also even within Pyongyang in a different in a different way. It's just that the scale. state the state is more powerful, right? In the capital and therefore it's harder to do things. It's developed so much more in Pyongyang. Okay. You now have hmm. streets lined in traffic. There's so many cars now in really? Pyongyang from what we hear from people that oh. have work in Pyongyang that huh. have been there, that spend time back and the, forth. This is how fast this is all happening, because as of a year ago, this is the last time I researched this and was reading your stuff and other people's stuff, but as of, I think, a year ago, people were saying that not much was happening in Pyongyang, or it was difficult to have you know, open black markets there, or black markets at all, because the state is so powerful there. There's so much... So it's more, but it's very much its state, because that is the capital. Mm-hmm. That's where a lot of the state, the development is happening there mm-hmm. that is not necessarily like black market activity. Right. So those markets do exist, but... You have, you know, even Kim Jong-un himself is the one that invested in this ski resort, has invested in a lot of these other things within Pyongyang, um, and you are seeing a different type of development that's happening. Um, State controlled. State controlled, but you also see, even just throughout the country, this type of 
uh, just de facto capitalism happening where you'll have individuals with more, they have more connections. So for example, you'll have somebody that may come to North Korea wanting to set up some sort of a private business or enterprise. And so what they'll do is approach some sort of a mid-level official or somebody that has some sort of access. And they'll strike a deal and they'll get the permission to start this business and then we'll then issue kickbacks to this official. Yeah, Cro you know, crony the, capitalism, we call it here, right? Right, But that's, exactly. not, that's not what you guys are interested in. I mean, that's, that's not, not, that's yeah, a very different that's type. Different. Of, that yep. is also happening. Sure. Uh, and Kim Jong-un is actually interested in the economy, in developing the economy. Mm -hmm. It doesn't seem like under quite, Under his control. Under his control. It, yeah. it also doesn't quite seem like they have figured out how to do that. And I think a lot of that being because of how closed off the country has been for so long sure. that the concern is the rate ha at which that happens and how much do they need to open up in order for the economy to develop. Yep. I mean, that is just an ongoing challenge that they're going to have. And so a lot of the really interesting things are what we talk about a lot of times with the black markets and the gray market and kind of the North Korean people who are accelerating this change, you can say, from a grassroots level. And for them, it's really just them living their everyday lives. It's engaging in these market activities as a way to survive, as a way to provide for themselves. But again, that type of activity, their consumption of illegal foreign and media, um, that type of stuff is really creating this pressure from the ground up. And that pressure um, is forcing the government to have to respond to some of these things. One example of this is that the government had to change the, their, their textbooks, right? What they were hmm. saying about the outside world, they had to evolve their own propaganda and their own education because you could no longer say that South Korea is poorer than North Korea, which used to be one of North Korea's lines, mm -hmm. you know, about the outside world. And, and, you know, people, now that they realize, it's undermining their own propaganda as they're starting to learn about the reality of the outside world through this foreign media, through contact with family members in the outside that have now gone to South Korea mm -hmm. and things like that. And so the government is having to respond to this pressure from the bottom up. And, you know, one of the most interesting things is going to be how do they ultimately respond as these changes happen? Because the reality is, is, you know, the North Korean people can never unsee what they've seen. They can't unlearn what they've learned. Right. The government cannot roll things back to where they were 20 years ago. And, you know, it would be very, very difficult to stop the growth or the progress of a lot of this type of change. If anything, all they can try to do is slow it down, hmm. slow it down or even accept it to a certain extent. And so people who have worked in North Korea have said that what they'll hear at least, for example, in Pyongyang, the line will be, oh, we want reform without opening. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the of line. They yeah. want reform without opening uh, because the mentality is, and the government's perspective is probably, if we open up too quickly, we potentially undermine ourselves here yeah, and shoot course. ourselves in the foot. Yeah, yeah. although, I mean, I, well, who knows, but it could end up sort of like China, right, where the ruling elite still controls the thing. But again, civil society and the way you know, ordinary people's lives are radically transformed. So who knows? And it does look like that's actually the direction that things are going yeah. in North Korea. It's Which, more of a China or Vietnam style yeah, reform. Yeah, right. And slow opening and reform. Yeah. So I, when I started researching this a couple of years ago, I didn't know much at all about North Korea, really. I knew the surface level stuff, you know, and not even much of that. So the first thing I did was I looked at a map. I think that's the first thing everyone should do when they start making claims about other countries. So I looked at the map and I realized, oh, okay, so it's on this peninsula. The southern border is with South Korea. The northern border is mostly with China. And there's a little piece that's with Russia. But if you look at a map of North Korea, there's this very, very long, meandering, ragged border with China. And I think it's all rivers, right? There's a sort of series of rivers that is the border between North Korea and China along there. And those, that, those areas in the north of Korea, of North Korea, are quite far from Pyongyang and relatively undeveloped. And there's less, because of all that, there's less of a state apparatus there. There's just fewer cops, fewer soldiers, right? I assume that's what's going on. So, and I started to hear about these stories about the Tumen River, which is in the very, very north of the country. So it's very remote. And on the other side of the Tumen River is China and all the stuff that's being produced in China. And the Two Men River, as I understand it, is relatively shallow. And so you can actually, I think most of the year, you can actually wade across it pretty safely. And so people just started, once China reformed and had these goods to offer on the other side in the 90s, uh, and people did it out of necessity, as you were saying earlier with the famine, people just started to walk literally across that river and go to China and buy stuff 
over there and then walk it back into North Korea and then either use it or sell it, resell it. And then that's how it started, right? It was in the, in the 90s. People were literally walking across that river and pulling stuff or hauling stuff on their backs and then selling it. And that was the beginning of this. It's a revolution. It already, I think it's already a revolution, you know, because people's lives are radically different because of that. I want to share a story, one of my favorite stories, actually, of uh, one of my friends. That's literally how he got started, hmm. and he was only 13 when he started yeah. doing cross-border trade. And he was, he lived so close to the border of China, he had a little Chinese friend right across the border. They would see each other at the river and would go back and forth. He would see his friend there, and he said, you know, I started to go across, and I would go to his house, and his mom would give me these delicious chocolates and cookies that I'd never tasted before, and I would start to take them back with me. And I realized that there was an opportunity here, so he said he used to take puppies and sell them across the border and then eventually was doing things like boots and small things like that. And so, you know, he's 13 years old, I think, when he started to come up with this understanding of the opportunity that was there. And by the time he left North Korea, he was 23. He had a full-scale business where he was bringing he had something like 30 people working under him. And he had, he was essentially bringing in everything from motorcycle engines to all different types of parts, car parts. And the, the 30 people that worked up for him, they were essentially going from China, getting these goods, and they would make this line across the river, just physically passing stuff across the border mm -hmm. to get it in. And he was sending and selling some of this, these parts to Pyongyang. Mm. And he had this full-scale business going by the time he was 23 years old. All totally illegal, right? Absolutely. Completely illegal. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, he said he had so much money he was making from this that he had to keep finding new places to hide it in the house. You know, there's no bank. You're not going to put your money in a bank in North Korea. Mm -hmm. So he would put them in these baggies and hide them in the ground under his house, put them in like the like the equivalent of like a fireplace essentially or you know where he would hide it under like soot and stuff like that because he didn't want the neighbors to know how much money he had he would try to just reinvest the money into his business but you know it's a great example of again just showing that he was just a little kid playing with his friend going back and forth and then he realized what this opportunity was yeah very savvy and then essentially built up this business to what it was. Yeah. I, I've heard a lot of stories of people starting the trade like that with food, just sort of mm -hmm. basic food to survive right yeah. during the famine and then realizing, Oh, I can make enough money from selling these kernels of corn or rice mm -hmm. or whatever it was to buy something different than food. And so they'd go back over to China with their money. And then by the 1990s in China, you could get stuff like luxury items like chocolate, you know, mm -hmm. which there are stories of people in the Soviet Union, by the way, in the mm -hmm. 50s and 60s who would get chocolate smuggled over the border. And it was like life changing for them. Mm -hmm. The taste of chocolate for the first time in your life when you're 30 or 40 years old. Can you imagine that? I mean, mm -hmm. that, you know, <laughs> yeah. the taste of something, you know, right. more than chocolate is in there. And then so the luxury goods start to come over the border in North Korea. And then it just continues, right? It keeps ramping up. But it sort of, I wouldn't say it ends, but it maybe culminates with the idea and the technology that enables this of getting media from mm -hmm. outside, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, and you guys have said this a lot in your work, you know, and I think it's completely right. It's when the South Korean soap operas and the South Korean movies and music videos and Hollywood movies and Hollywood TV shows, and people sort of download huge chunks of the internet onto USB sticks and then bring it over and everybody sort of reads the internet on mm -hmm. USB sticks. It's amazing. By the way, this happens in Vietnam too. This is mm -hmm. what goes on, which is heavily censored, not to that extent, but people read vast swaths of the internet on a USB stick. Mm -hmm. So some of the most amazing revelatory and inspiring stories are about like uh, women in mm -hmm. particular in North Korea. Because I think a lot of the trading, the smuggling mm -hmm. was by women. Women sort of led the charge in some ways here. Mm -hmm. And uh, the black markets, which by the way, it's, it's called, the, the Korean word is jang, jangmadong. Is that right? Jangmadong, jang yeah. yeah. And I found out from your work that a lot, of, a lot of people who were leading the way in these markets were women. And what they would do is... You know, there's so many stories of women watching these South Korean TV shows and you guys have a documentary movie coming out and mm -hmm. I just watched it last night 
And the most amazing scene to me is this one woman, um, Donby. Mm -hmm. She talks about and shows the camera how she would watch TV, mm -hmm. which was an entirely different way of watching TV than we do it. She would study it. She would study. The plot was sort of secondary to her. Mm -hmm. She would study what was in the background. Mm -hmm. So she would count the number of cars on the street mm -hmm. and notice what makes and models the cars were. And she would look at the tall buildings in the landscape shots. And she would notice people's fashion in particular. And I remember she talks about seeing, you know, a woman in the background, just an extra on this mm -hmm. TV show, right? With blonde hair, mm -hmm. a Korean woman. How do you have blonde hair <laughs> when you're Korean? She thought, well, oh, then they found out that they dyed their hair. And the next thing you know, she has this business basically selling South Korean or Western or American fashions to North Koreans, you know, hair dye. And that in itself becomes its own cottage industry. North Korean women learn how to dye hair and do hairstyles that are South Korean and fashion and all that, all the rest of it. But she said also, when she was watching these things, that what stood out to her also was that the women in South Korea, which by the way, according, you know, by American standards is pretty patriarchal and sexist, but by North Korean standards is, is a feminist utopia because what she saw in the South Korean TV shows, and I'll take her word for it, is a lot of female characters standing up to men and being independent and driving cars and uh, shouting down cat catcallers and being entrepreneurs and starting businesses and going to school and basically do and having sex and doing what they want to do, which apparently in North Korea, I didn't know this either until just recently, I guess is a very patriarchal sexist culture. I didn't know that because it's funny because communist <laughs> people who are now apologists for the Soviet Union and Eastern European communism and Cuban communism often point to the relatively feminist nature of those regimes relatively and i'm not even sure it's true <laughs> but in some ways you know they at least were sort of proud of the fact that there were some women you know in particular positions that weren't allowed before but in north korea i guess they don't do that it's it's they've hung on to the old um, capitalist uh, imperialist <laughs> culture of <laughs> extreme sexism. So women aren't even allowed to ride motorbikes. <laughs> That's what Tumby was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so all, all the best things of the 20th century are right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like that all the best revolutions of the <laughs> last hundred or so years is in Donby watching, studying, studying with that really aggressive mind of hers. I love it. <laughs> studying TV TV show, a dumb soap opera that we all look our, down our noses at, by the way. <laughs> and the whole world turns from there mm -hmm. because of what she, she and thousands or millions of other young women in North Korea are doing. I mean, that's, you, will, you will have a hard time finding a professor mm -hmm. of foreign relations, any think tank in Washington, D.C., who would care one bit about Don B. watching TV. Whereas you guys and I think that's the whole ball game right there. Once they start doing that, good luck trying to control these people long term. It's incredible. I think the more I hear and I talk with, especially more recent defectors um, and young young defectors, one of the interesting things, and I think you meant me this point in the very beginning. Um, you know, one of the perspectives oftentimes is just North Korea is just never going to change. We should just accept it right. for what it is. Mm -hmm. Um, I had an opportunity to go to Libya shortly after the revolution, wow. and I remember speaking to young people there, and it was incredible. And I asked them, you know, what was it like to be part of, you know, this revolution? And, you know, what was the thinking? What were you thinking? And for them, they said, you know, we grew up, and our parents and our grandparents' generation, they just told us to just give up hope. They told us that Gaddafi is just going to be in power forever. That's how it's always been. You know, we just have to accept it for how it is and just figure out how to live our lives within the system. And um, I was talking to some young men, and they were saying, you know what, what really pissed us off was that we couldn't even get married. You have to have a certain financial capacity in order to even propose and then get married. And there were all these men who couldn't even take that next step in their lives because of how bad the economy was, because they didn't have jobs, because they didn't have financial capacity, because of all these reasons that were really holding them back. And they said, you know what, that for them, there was no future then. 
they couldn't even advance on a, on a social level to a certain extent that that's what drove them to say, forget this. Mm -hmm. Because they were young. I mean, these were people in their 20s, like young 20s, young to mid-20s. And they said they would much rather not live their lives the rest of this way. And so they figured, what do we have to lose? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I think about North Korea and I think about and I talk to a lot of our young friends, a lot of times I get that sentiment. And it's not by any means, and nor do we by any means advocate for a specific type of change in North Korea. Mm -hmm. You know, all we are are pro-change, and we just want to understand what are the changes that are happening, how are the people driving them, and how can we support them in accelerating those changes. But, you know, for young North Koreans, I would say, you know, after the famine, definitely, you know, over two decades ago or so, people were leaving for economic reasons, definitely. They were hungry, they were looking for food, they were looking for money. They needed to find a way to survive. But increasingly over the more recent years, five to seven years or so, very interesting shift in demographics because of how difficult it's gotten to leave North Korea. Under Kim Jong-un, the number of North Korean defectors to make it to South Korea has decreased by about 50% right. right off the bat in the first year he came in. So it's becoming extremely difficult. Numbers this year are already down another 20% from last year. We're seeing the lowest number of defectors come through to South Korea since 2001. So this is really low. And what we're seeing, though, are young people coming out and the reasons for leaving being more broadly political now. Hmm. So, you know, their reasons being they are actively seeking freedom. They are actively seeking their definition of freedom. And to a lot of them, it's not political. Mm -hmm. To them, freedom means I see these things. I want to you know, like the young man in the film talked about, I want to do what I want to do. I want to see what I want to see. I want to go where I want to go. Yeah. And I can't do that in North Korea. And so for these young people, they really think about the rest of their life. And they're like, yeah. no, it's not like North Koreans are watching foreign media and going, oh, my gosh, that's South Korea. I've been lied to my whole life. <laughs> it's not like that Truman show moment right. where it clicks yeah. all of a sudden. Exactly. Right. It's a slow realization. It's over a period of time. Mm -hmm. and it's over the continual consumption of this foreign media, different types of content even. And for a lot of people, it's just news. It's traffic. It's very mundane things like even Tanbi saying she's not looking at the storyline and being like, oh, that's interesting. Yep. She's saying, look at these buildings. Yeah. Look at how... This is the realization a lot of people had. They were like, these soap operas could very well just be propaganda mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. But after watching a lot of the dramas, they realized there's no way they could have made a set this big <laughs> with this many big buildings. Right, with the entire skyline of Seoul. Right, yeah, right. exactly. Yeah, I just, I, I'm just always struck that, I don't know what to say, but that the most radical, important, possibly powerful person on earth right now might be a teenage girl in a border town in North Korea. Oh, by the way, watching TV. That's all I want her to do. That's all she is doing, apparently. Watching TV and then, you know, imitating in her style, her fashion, her language, her speech, all of it, who she sees on the TV. That is it. Those are the people right there. The last people those think tanks in Washington would ever expect to do anything worthwhile. So I wanted to tell you... Um, and I want to ask you about yourself, but first I wanted to tell you what you're up against in this country. I'm not sure you guys understand this. <laughs> <laughs> think tanks, academics, people, most people working in this field think nothing of what you're doing. <laughs> they think nothing of watching TV, South Korean soap operas. If the people in North Korea were smuggling over the border a lot of PBS shows, maybe. Maybe that would be interesting to them. If they were smuggling over the border uh, Shakespeare's plays and reading them in secret, away from the cops, yeah, that might be interesting. But here's the problem, Hannah, I think, is, you know, because I come from this world of academia, these, these are people who are basically elitists culturally. Most people in academia, and by the way, all foreign policy establishment people pretty much come out of academia in one way or another every one of them is either a former professor or is closely associated with the university in some way or another. They're all cultural elitists. They all went to Ivy League schools or Stanford or Berkeley, and they think essentially that, you know, what we call highbrow culture is better and good, and they really are quite disgusted with ordinary poor and working class people here or anywhere else in the world who watch TV shows like that who care about the latest music video, who care about the latest pop star or celebrity. 
So they either ignore it entirely in their own work, or they go out of their way to sort of scold people, and essentially, for either consuming that stuff or for you know, talking about it the way you do. And they also do this. They also express when they do talk about this, and usually they just ignore it, but when, they do, when they're forced to talk about this, it's sort of they talk about it with disappointment. They're disappointed. They want the North Korean people to be interested in different things outside their world. They want them to be smuggling over the border different stuff. And most importantly, they want them to be doing political organizing in the traditional sense. They want to have a social movement with a name on it and organizations and leadership who give speeches and maybe organize strikes or marches. And they want people to take over the government and reorganize government in a particular way. Well, you know, to do all that, you don't have time to watch TV. So to them, I think that watching TV and listening to pop music and, dre and wearing blue jeans is not only trivial and a waste of time, it's actually, I think, for most people in my world, in academia and foreign policy, it's actually regressive. That it is moving people further away from significant change. I'm sure they also argue that it strengthens the regime because it anesthetizes the people, makes them sort of, I've heard this argument many, many times, that it makes the people dumb and apathetic. Watching a whole lot of dumb TV, bad TV makes you apathetic. Well, yeah, I think it's true that it makes you apathetic toward the workings of the government. I think that's true. But it certainly shows that they care a whole lot about living differently in their own lives, right? And if that's not real change, I don't know what is. So I, I'm sorry to tell you, I don't think you're gonna get much traction in, in my world among uh, academics and think tank types. They don't want North Koreans to do what you're talking about. You know, I, I think in, in other places in the world, I definitely have seen that and I would agree with you. A North Korea and on North Korea, I think, for whatever reason, there's definitely, I'm sure, those um, academics who probably fall within that category, for sure, absolutely, certain academics and think tanks, uh, and they will continue to do what they're doing on their own analysis and, you know, in the way in which they think about how to best approach North Korea and will continue down that pathway, and, and that's important, and I think it's because we have to cover the full spectrum of what we're trying to do. The other side of that is that when it comes to North Korea, it's virtually impossible. I think you saw you know, in, in one of the papers that quote from the New York Times. You could lift that quote about North Korea's, about provocations from North Korea. It's just a cycle. And that quote was from 1994 New York Times article. But if you read that without a date on it, you would think that was published last week. And it is the same story over and over and over again. And the problem is, and I think that there are some people in academia and in think tanks that are coming around to realize that if they cannot evolve the strategy and approach on North Korea, then it will become obsolete. And that's what the problem has ha like that's what the problem is right now on North Korea. There is a real lack of creativity when it comes to North Korea, for some reason, even beyond a lot of these other countries. You know, when we look at, just as an example, what the U.S. government had done in the USSR, what they had done in Cuba, what they've done in Burma, there's a lot of creativity that's been put behind that. Um, and I think on North Korea, for some reason, there's been a real lack of innovation as we think about the best way to approach the issue, the best way to find progress. And like you've mentioned before, that's it's already happening. It's almost like the people are already promoting this change, this important change inside the country at a grassroots level. And they're doing it regardless of whether people in D.C. or in academia are paying attention at all. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's almost like we're having to catch up to understand mm -hmm. What have you guys been doing for the last 15 to 20 years while no one was paying attention? And help us to understand how did these changes happen? How are they continuing to happen? And what can we really do to come alongside you and to support them so that they can happen even faster? Mm -hmm. And I think 
you know, what we're starting to see is as we push, and, and I will say, I think there was a period of time in D.C. where it was dead. People were just tired. There was so much North Korea fatigue, especially from a humanitarian perspective and from a policy perspective. But there are some people that are, that have an appetite for this new thinking, this new approach. And that they've seen the role that information has played in other countries around the world. Yeah. And they really believe in that and want to... Who are these people? I haven't come across them. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to make some introductions? Yeah, please. No, seriously. So here's the thing, though. I think you're missing this. <laughs> I really do. It's not that they're not creative and not innovative and not thinking outside the box. They don't, they don't want to think outside the box in the way that you are. Because what you're calling for, essentially, correct me if I'm wrong is for the United States as an institution, as a government, certainly, to do less, aren't you? In other words, it's not, it's not for us to solve, essentially. I mean, in other words, continue the trade, but that's not the government, right? Continue sending, continue make movies. Make, here's what Americans should do, right? Make more, continue making movies and TV shows and je blue jeans and all the rest of it and, and, and open trade as much as possible and just let the trade go let all those things go over there right so americans can certainly contribute to this but just continue doing what you're doing guys and then don't uh, stop the flow of trade to north korea so the the process you're describing in the jungmadong generation is an uncontrolled thing it's unregulated it's it's anarchic in that way it's literally individuals doing something differently that they're not supposed to do. And then many, many individuals doing all these different things that are illegal, that are culturally inappropriate, all the rest of it. And I think that's why the Council on Foreign Relations, as far as I know, hasn't yet mentioned Jong Madong, black markets, or the people of North Korea in any of its policy papers. I don't think you're gonna find much from the Brookings Institution on this. I don't think you're gonna find any congressperson talking about this. It's kind of remarkable, but they, do they talk about North Korea? Oh, all the time, every single day. They just talk about Kim Jong-un and the, and the regime and missiles. Missiles, 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 and the DMZ, and how many troops should we have there, and sanctions. Sanctions is the worst idea, because that stops the flow of trade. You know, if you want to choke off the people from changing their lives, that's the best way to go, is to, is to sanction or embargo North Korea. So here's the thing. People in think tanks, I'm sorry to disparage them, but I'm going to continue anyway. People in think tanks in foreign policy, people in government who are interested in foreign policy, I believe they are primarily interested in changing things on their own terms, meaning controlling how other countries operate. Foreign policy is a policy to change the lives of people around the world in foreign countries right. who we've never met. So that's why I think they're not just not aware of black markets in North Korea. It's that they don't want that because these are people operating outside the control of government. Quick thing, and then I want to ask you about yourself, but you can also respond to this. This reminds me of have you heard of the Edelweiss pirates in Germany, in Nazi Germany? Okay. So at the height of Nazi, the Nazi regime in the late 1930s, this is when the Hitler Youth was mandatory for all youth in Germany. And the war is ramping up, and you know they have sent most men to the front to serve in the Wehrmacht to fight in the war, obviously totalitarian regime. Huge numbers. I mean, probably tens of thousands of teenagers in Germany, these are Aryan, blonde youth, not Jews, just left. And they went into the hills in the forests, and they just played. And they like played guitars, and they sang American songs, and they pretended to be pirates and Indians from the dime novels and the Hollywood movies that they saw. And they fought the Hitler youth in the streets who tried to, you know, capture them. And it was a huge problem. And by the end of the war, they were actually arming, them, arming themselves and fighting the Gestapo in the streets of Berlin. So the West, the United States, only becomes aware of them by like 1944. This is many years on and the war is almost done. And, and they just don't know what to do with these kids. There's a lot of them by then. And what happens is the war ends, the U.S. conquers uh, Germany and, take, and basically colonizes Germany with the Soviet Union. So it's a new regime a Western friendly regime. Well, guess who, what the Edelweiss pirates then started doing? They started attacking American GIs and they started being, they were anti-American and they were calling for the United States and the Soviets to leave Germany and to leave them alone. That's the problem here. You know, you have some Edelweiss pirates in North Korea 
who apparently are much more interested in doing their own thing than in who their rulers are. So changing rulers isn't going to make them more um, cooperative. So I think that's why the Council on Foreign Relations doesn't want these people. I think it's not that they're just ignoring them and not paying attention to them. I think it's that they, they are hostile, actually, to them. Go ask a CFR person next time you meet one what they think of these kids. And it's mostly kids, by the way, or it's a lot of them are kids. It's a lot of teenagers doing this stuff, just like, just like in Nazi Germany. So I guess it shouldn't tell you then that we've been at CFR and have spoken there. <laughs> okay. Well, and what do they think? You know, again, I think it just depends. Depending on the membership, people mm-hmm. who show up to those events. Oh, well, yeah. The CFR has these public events, right? So right. Any, anybody can show up to them. You get the whole gamut of people. I'm talking about their policy position papers. Policy position papers, yeah. You, they haven't put anything Nothing. out on this. Right? right. Right. They'll bring in speakers. They'll bring in North Koreans to speak about it. And, you know, I think, again, it's, it's a start for us. I think, you know, this is definitely an area where I know that you focused on, especially with other issues around the world, for us, I think for, for us, our main thing is really just, hey, we're on the ground. Mm-hmm. Our focus is just to figure out the strategies that we think are most effective and that are already showing us where change is happening. Oh. And if people don't want, if they're not interested in those strategies and those approaches, there's not much else we can do to convince them of that, but to find allies and partners that are on the same page as us. Okay. Because these things are going to change. So they the, are changing already. So this is the question for you that I, I meant to ask, and I, I'm not clear on this, actually. I don't know what your answer is to this. But So what is the strategy that you're recommending? What should America, and in particular the United States government, do? Our main thing is we're not an advocacy organization. We're not out there trying to create policy recommendations for different governments. Right. We are essentially working with the North Korean people. A big part of our work is actually helping North Korean refugees in China. And so there's a humanitarian imperative there, but there's also a strategic one. These are the people that we can reach and that we can actually provide assistance to. And so for North Koreans who are hiding in China because they're at risk of being forcibly repatriated by the Chinese government back to North Korea, we have networks in place that essentially help them to escape from China through a sort of underground railroad, a 3,000 mile long underground railroad. Mm-hmm. Our supporters here fund that whole rescue route. We bring them all the way out to Southeast Asia, and then they are legally processed for resettlement in countries like South Korea and the United States. So that is both a humanitarian imperative and a strategic one. Why it's a strategic one is because we work very closely with these North Koreans then after they've resettled, and not just the people that we've helped to bring out, but, you know, there's 30,000 plus North Koreans that have resettled in South Korea to date. And By the way, sorry, what, what's the policy of the South Korean government and the Chinese government toward North Korean refugees? So the Chinese government does not recognize North Koreans as refugees. Even though China is a signatory to the 1951 convention, they refuse to recognize them as refugees. They call them all economic migrants. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, they <laughs> say that they have every right then to find North Koreans, round them up, and then to forcibly send them back. And that's what happens now. That is what the happens. The Chinese government rounds them up and sends them back. That's what happens. And in fact, it's actually ramped up significantly this year, mm. in particular over the last few months. Mm. Very, very high numbers. And I'm talking not just refugees, I'm talking children. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, and we, they will send them back to North Korea. And the problem with that is the punishment that North Koreans can face, as I mentioned before, it's illegal to leave North Korea without state permission. So if you did not get a visa or bribe your way to even paying for a visa to get out of that country and you get caught and sent back, you could potentially face very severe punishments, you know, torture, um, internment in a political prison camp. You know, it really just depends. And some of these people that are getting caught are getting caught very close to the, sti- the, ch- the southern part of China. It's clear that they were trying to leave. Mm-hmm. You know, defectors who are cl- closer to the border will sometimes try to make a case that I was just over here looking for food and I was going to come back, you know, even though that's not the case. Uh, and so it's extremely risky. It's dangerous. And in a lot of ways, you know, China has an obligation. They have a responsibility. But because of their own concerns of instability in the region and not wanting to necessarily, you know, as soon as they change their policy or their stance on, on North Korean refugees, they're afraid that there will be a flood of North Koreans coming across that border. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so um, they will find these North Koreans, forcibly send them back. And so a lot of the North Koreans that tend to cross also, so of the defectors that have come out, about 70% end up being female, end up being women. Hmm. And in China... Why is that? It's for a variety of different reasons. The famine... After, so another thing that triggered, obviously, was this refugee flood. After the famine happened, all these North Koreans going into China, 
Um, again, initially because of wanting to find food and money and all that kind of stuff. But what you see happening is it was easier for women to go to leave initially. So in the very, very beginning, it was mostly men. You don't really know what's in China. Kind of hmm. maybe the Wild, the wild West, West, feeling of the Wild West. Right. Some men start to cross over there, realize they can work, make some money, send it back, come back and forth. But essentially, you know, the men all work for the state. Everyone works for the state. And the women are typically, were typically the ones who were at home raising the family, taking care of them. So for the women to go across into China um, to try to find food, money, all that stuff, it was less noticeable, one. Two, there was also a pull factor. You know, there were trafficking and these brokers that were trying to profit off of bringing North Korean women across the border to sell them to Chinese men, mm -hmm. um, to get them to work in sex chat rooms, brothels. You know, during the early 2000s, I would say really at the peak of when you started to see most North Koreans coming through, it was estimated that maybe 70 to 80 percent of female North Korean refugees were being trafficked or were being sold at that time. It was very high. And a lot of that just being because of the fact that they have no status in China. The Chinese government wasn't protecting them. Local officials weren't doing anything. So these women were extremely vulnerable to exploitation, labor exploitation, sexual exploitation, all of these things. Uh, and so, and you even hear cases like the story of Joseph I mentioned. During the, the height of the famine, his mom made the decision to sell his sister in China because she thought that would be a better life for her. And she couldn't afford to take care of both of her kids. Mm -hmm. And so it was a survival tactic for her. And then you hear other stories of people whose family members sold them across the border. Um, and so it's, it's a whole gamut of reasons why. But um, as these women are there, and again, that's actually another reason why you see the majority of the women, it was mostly women in the marketplaces too. Mm -hmm. uh, initially and so as you have these defectors that are there why do you think that is why do you think it's been women sort of at the vanguard of change at least in the black markets because the men were supposed to be working for the state okay and so it was the women that were really able to go out then and to initially engage in some of these illegal activities or hmm. um, that eventually some of them are now in markets that are legal or there's a lot of black markets gray markets and then right. state-run markets things like that and so huh. Um, it was primarily women, and at a, at a point there was also, it was actually the state created these rules where it was only women in markets, or only during certain times <laughs> were they allowed to be in the markets, and I, men were allowed to be in the markets at certain times. I love it. So the, the sexist patriarchy actually completely backfired here, right? <laughs> <laughs> but what's interesting is, you know, you work for the state, and at a point after the state socialist economy collapsed, you know, people would go to work, and you're not doing anything there. You're essentially, it's defunct factories and things like that. And so people would essentially come and pay a bribe to their boss to not have to show up to work, so that they could then go and engage in market activities mm -hmm. where they were making the real money. But going back to the refugees, yeah. you know, one of the really important reasons why we work with North Korean refugees, again, is because after they come out, it's about 50% of them manage to reestablish contact with their family members inside North Korea. And they do this because brokers on the border will smuggle Chinese cell phones into North Korea, right along the border. And so, um, Sukhil was there last year, I, I think, and, and got this great picture that just shows this radio tower literally on the border of China. It's literally as close to North Korea as you could possibly be. This massive cell tower. And so if you're on the border of North Korea, you can absolutely wow. use a smuggled Chinese cell phone to call outside. Huh. Uh, and so you have um, brokers who, or you have North Koreans who have these smuggled Chinese cell phones along the border area, and you can pay to use it, or you can pay a broker to make an outside, a call to an international call. 50% of the North Koreans that have gone to South Korea have reestablished contact in North Korea with their family members. They're talking to them. They're talking to them either about the fact that they're in South Korea or that they have left North Korea and what it's like in the outside world. And not only that, they're sending money. So this remittance money is really important because on average, they're sending about $1,500 to $2,000 a year to their family members. And so after broker fees and all that stuff, they're probably taking about 30% off the top wow. to deliver the money to their family members. And that's super fascinating in and of itself as a process. But the money, all told, when you look at how many defectors are probably sending this money, it's about 15 million to 20 million US dollars every year that's going into that country hmm. through these illicit networks hmm. to their family members. And it's in these key areas, these hotspots of change. And so these family members then are using that money to essentially reinvest in their own business activities, their own market activities to survive, to protect themselves, to provide for their families. Yeah. And so this outside, these outputs 
from defectors on the outside are actually really important in helping to accelerate a lot of these changes that are happening inside the country. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a paradox here, though, that sort of worries me a bit, which is that it seems as if well, no, it clearly is the case that the standard of living for many North Koreans is higher now because of the black markets. And so the regime indirectly there's still a big, there's still a big disparity. Benefits I will from that, say though, right? so, it's not like um, I think it's relative, mm -hmm, right? Sure, it's yeah. far better now than I'm sure it was for most families 15 years ago. Um, and a big part of that just being, um, and it really depends also. I'm just saying it's better for the regime to have people, you know, have food than to not have food. Oh, right. Yeah, so right. But that's, because you're seeing the informal economy. But there's, right. so there's the paradox there, right? right? So it's, it's, it's both undercutting the government's power, but it's also maybe propping it up in some way, or I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say because it sounds like ideologically and culturally that it's everything's running counter to the to the government and its interests that from your reports and many other people's reports that young people in particular are becoming less and less respectful toward the government um, and that they are becoming sort of rebellious in a very sort of low grade but very important way that they simply don't care much you know, and they don't have much um, fealty to the to the rulers. Is that right? Is that is there good evidence of that? I again, I I think it depends, and mm -hmm. I think we're always careful, and we always caveat this to say that people think extremely differently depending on who they are, where they live, yeah. what their experiences are, right. and so we derive really just what we know based off of the people that we have the ability to talk to and that's mostly the defectors and then we also corroborate what we find with people who go in and out of north korea who yeah. do work there you know everyone from diplomats all the way down to ngos but mm -hmm. there are definitely there's definitely um at least for us as we look at the Changmadang generation sort of the equivalent of north korean millennials a different attitude toward the government and toward the state because they grew up in the 90s you know these millennials are you know, grew up in the 80s and 90s when they don't remember ever getting anything from the government. Right. They weren't around to get anything from the public distribution system. And so they don't feel like, you know, for many young people, their thinking is we grew up in the markets by our mom's side, actually seeing what it was like to actually engage in this type of activity, you know, supporting ourselves through that. Right. They're also living this contradiction every day where they're seeing things on their screens that they really like that the government is telling them is bad and evil and the product of an evil system, capitalism and South Korea and America. It sort of requires cognitive dissonance in a way to be North Korean doing that. You know, it's sort of interesting to see how people will work that out. And, you know, in the Soviet Union, by the way, there are still people who want to return to communism. And I'm sure whatever happens in North Korea, there will be people there, too, who want to go back to the good old days of communism when they were taken care of. I get that, too, by the way. I get I get the desire to have security without freedom. I understand that. It's not my bag, but I, I really do understand that. And certainly pre-famine, I could imagine there being quite a bit of nostalgia, actually, when the government really took care of us and we didn't have to worry ever about being unemployed or hungry. You know, that's going to be a problem too. But historically, if you look at all the countries, and it's been many countries so far who've gone through this, a similar process, they've all ended up pretty much on the other side as more or less a market economy and more or less, you know, free in ways that we consider to be free. So can I ask you about yourself? Yeah. <laughs> sure. So why do you do this? Oh, <laughs> so I'm Korean American. My grandmother is actually from North Korea, but I grew up not knowing the first thing about North Korea or even really Korean culture, actually. Where'd you grow up? Um, I was born in Michigan. Where? Uh, Lansing. Uh huh. Uh, grew up there. Michigan State. Were Michigan, you academics right. in the family? No. Okay. No. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, grew up in Michigan and then moved out to the East Coast um, and went to school in New York and worked, you know, worked where'd, in New York. Where'd you go to school? I went to NYU. Uh -huh. For what? Uh, communications and oh, journalism. It shows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good at this. Oh, gee, thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. And then I worked... Um, did you want to be a reporter? What did you want to do? I d <laughs> Originally, I thought that maybe I wanted to go into, yeah, news, journalism, something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Turned out not to work out that way. Ended up working in corporate, worked uh, in advertising. Actually loved it. Really loved my job. Great. It was really interesting. It was fun. And it was right around that time I learned about North Korea. So it was quite late. Wow. I'd heard about North Korea here and there, but... 
I think what really shocked me was uh, I read this book about a young North Korean man. Um, his name is Kang Chohan. And when he was nine years old, he was put into one of North Korea's most brutal political prison camps, Yodok. And he ended up being put into that prison camp with his entire family because North Korea practices a three-generation policy of punishment. And so his grandfather had been accused of betraying the country, had betraying the state, and as a result, his grandmother, his parents, and him, as, as a nine-year-old boy, were put into Yodok prison camp. And he lived there for 10 years. So his story pretty much outlined and documented what his life was like in this political prison camp. So it was really shocking for me to read that. I mean, I didn't know much about Korea, South Korea or North Korea, but to read this story was fascinating and also really surprising that a place like that could still exist today. So your grandmother never talked about it? No. Hmm. She never talked about her life, never talked about North Korea. I didn't even actually know that she has family. So I didn't actually know anything about her story until probably about five years. So I've been working now on this issue for over 11 years. It's wow. been a long time. And like maybe five years ago, I was having a conversation with my mom. And my grandmother is actually still alive. She lives here in the States. Hmm. She uh, just turned 101. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I always joke with her. I'm like, is it because you, you're waiting for North Korea to open so we can go back together? <laughs> but I think when her health wasn't doing so well, she finally started opening up and, and talking and saying things to my mom. And I think a lot of that was just, you know, she had never talked about these things before. She came over in 1950? So she left... Yes, she left in the 50s from North Korea. So like during the war or right around? No, before the war. Before the war, okay. And um, had no idea she was never going to be able to go back. She actually went to Japan where her brother was studying at that time. And that's all I knew about her story, that she went to Japan and then eventually couldn't go back and then went on to South Korea. And she never commented on politics, North, Korea, North Korean regime or any of that? No, nothing, nothing. Right. And then I found out... She's, mentally, know, she's a mentally healthy person, unlike you and me. <laughs> it's probably true. Yes, I know it's true. <laughs> um, but, you know, I found out later on that actually she had been married in North Korea and she hmm. had a husband and two kids and has never seen them or spoken to them since then. And so that was an interesting revelation for me because this whole time, you know, I knew my grandmother's from North Korea. I assumed I had family there, but it was never really that personal in that way until I found that oh, out. And that was only about five years ago. Oh, so you probably have family there now. Definitely have yeah, family there. Right. And so, you know, it was really interesting for me. I mean, it didn't change at all my level of passion or my interest at all in this issue, but um, it was a very interesting sort of moment to kind of learn about that and to realize, wow, I, I have family in North Korea. In fact, sometimes I wonder as I meet a lot of the North Koreans that we work with and that we, we, um, that we meet, you know, uh, and I think about that. I think about the long term future. I think what sustains me is when I think about the long term future. I truly believe it will be the North Korean people who will achieve their liberty and it will be in our lifetime. And I really believe that. Hmm. And I think that that's the reason why we do this work. It's the reason why we work so hard and everyone here, um, we believe so fervently in that there is a real opportunity for us to do something. And for us, that means, you know, understanding what the North Korean people themselves have done to overcome these challenges inside the country. It's providing assistance and support to North Koreans who have managed to escape and to leave that regime. And then it's to find ways that we can accelerate that change and to make that happen. I think you're, well, so I think all, all of what you do is important and great, but I think you just missed the most important thing, which is that you tell the world what's happening there. You tell the world what North Koreans are doing right. on the ground. I mean, to me, that's what's most important. And you just, ha again, I just come back to this thing where you, you are, you and Link are, seem to be really only interested in that. You know, you're, you're, you're showing the world these people changing their own lives without the assistance of anybody really, except those who are willing to trade with them. That's it. And that's not even assistance, really. That's just trade. That's just mutual aid. So it's, it's pretty remarkable. So, but, but there are a lot of things to be passionate about. And I get that you're, you know, North Korean, so I can, that makes sense. But I've known lots and lots of Korean Americans who don't care at all <laughs> about North Korea. Why do you care so much to devote your life to it? Oh, <laughs> I think, you know, for me, it's really one of these things where there's a bunch of different reasons. A lot of it is personal for me. I have a, I, there's like this strange, deep sense of justice, and that's probably very uh, antithetical to a lot of what we've talked about. Be careful. Be I know, careful with that I know. justice feeling. I think it's really just justice in the sense of yeah. what's right and what's wrong. Yeah, it well, it depends on how you define it, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I yeah. think there's a lot that is wrong in North Korea. And I think that when I, you know, it, there's this part of me that just 
get so angry. So uh, let me try to illustrate this. So for us, we've been around since 2004. We didn't start getting involved in the work in the underground helping North Koreans to escape in China until 2010. And the reason for that was because I had a friend who was a researcher and spent some time in China and also um, in South Korea meeting with these women who had been trafficked and trying to understand just doing research, interviewing them, putting together some of this reporting to understand, you know, what's going on with this situation of these so many women being trafficked. And I remember her t sitting with me having coffee and telling me that, you know, I was doing this research and it's already bad enough that they, these women find themselves in the situation where they're not getting any protection or help from the Chinese government as refugees, but then as women, they're being further exploited and all of these things. But then to meet these broker networks or to pay people to bring them out through this sort of underground to try to reach freedom. Um, and once they get to Southeast Asia, for example, a lot of these broker networks and these individuals then further taking advantage of them and exploiting them, stealing their money, raping them further, these types of things. For me, there's something visceral in that that just really pisses me off. You know, you have, uh, you know, you have some of these people and North Korean people are seriously some of the most resilient and incredible people I've ever met in my life. I always joke around and I say, you know what, if I was North Korean, I don't even know if I, I probably wouldn't have made it out. I wouldn't have made it across that border. I probably couldn't have made it through that journey. It is so extremely difficult. I don't think we can even begin to understand how difficult that journey is to escape. It's 3,000 miles long and I have had a 75 year old couple all the way down to a woman who was nine months pregnant to a woman carrying her, you know, three month old baby throughout that Wait, journey. Wait, sorry, what's 3,000 miles long? This journey of these North Koreans from the border of China uh -huh. going all the way to Southeast Asia where oh, they're escaping essentially to be able okay. to come out mm -hmm. as refugees and then to be able to make So they have to way. go through China? They go all the way through China. Because, all the way Because through. they can't stay in China because the Chinese government. That's right. Like, right. So when you look at the map them. actually it's kind of I did, okay, I didn't kind actually, of absurd. I didn't know that. I thought there were a lot of permanent refugees in China. So there are people who try to live there and so for some of them that have married to that are married to these Chinese men um, uh, sometimes they try to get fake IDs or sometimes they try to get paperwork that will allow them to stay. But most of these women, if they do end up getting married off to these Chinese women, they don't have any legal status. At any given point, there there have been times when the police will come around and do crackdowns. Right. They'll round up these women and they'll just send them back to North Korea. And they don't speak Chinese. After being there for a, for a while, they become fluent. But when they get there, they don't. Oh, so no, of course. But that border region of China, North Korea, actually, there is um, a large population of ethnically Korean Chinese people that live there. Mm -hmm. So it's actually when defectors used to, North Koreans first used to go across the border, the town there, there was a lot of signs in Korean and everything like that, because there's a large Korean community there. So you're saying that most refugees, though, end up in Southeast Asia? So what ends up happening is they have to get to Southeast Asia to then be in contact with the South Korean embassy, the U.S. embassy, oh, okay. so that they can try to get moved then to South Korea, the U.S. as a refugee. So that's kind of the whole underground route. But 3,000 miles. 3,000 miles. And that's just from China to Southeast Asia. And they're Asia. not flying in planes, I take it. No. <laughs> and a lot of walking, I would bet, too, right? There's a lot of walking. Yeah. It's all types of terrain. I mean... Getting a ride when you can, getting on a train when you can. Well, it's a more developed network. So, for example, that's where that's what we do. Okay, we have okay. a network of people on the ground that hmm. help North Koreans to escape. Hmm. So we help them to get out of China safely and to Southeast Asia. And so... But it's still not a flight. It's not an easy train ride or anything like that. I mean, there are times when they are in the jungle. They are in mountains. They are on foot. It's a really dangerous 3,000-mile journey that's really difficult. Wow. And so... Um, but even just to get out of North Korea in and of itself sure. is extremely dangerous. Oh, sure. And so, yeah, I think when we meet these North Koreans and we kind of understand what they've been through, um, and then they come out, it's sometimes really unfortunate because I do think that there's a certain perception or a certain discrimination against them because of the fact that some North Koreans have said that leaving North Korea and going to South Korea was like getting in a time machine and fast forwarding 60 years mm -hmm. because of how behind they sure. were. Yeah. So we would call people like that backwards, right? Right. That's that's the discrimination you're talking about. Yeah, and yeah. I, I think even from the perspective of how fast-paced South Korean society is, it's, it it can be difficult for North Koreans to adjust quickly there. You know, you talked about how we're trying to tell the world about North Korea and people and about their lives, but in effect, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change the narrative on North Korea completely. And in South Korea, effectively, what we're trying to do is not even just change the narrative, but we're actually trying to rebrand North Korea hmm. to a certain extent. Yeah. I mean, if you just look at the number of people inside North Korea who think differently and behave differently, whose lives are different because of their own actions, 
just over the last month, over the last year, over the last five years, certainly, just the numbers of people that we see doing these things, I think it's an inevitable conclusion that it's going to happen fairly soon, historically at least, you know, in historical terms. I think it's going to happen. I think in our lifetime is very possible. And I might even say probable. So let's hope. But thank you so much for doing this. And thanks for what you're doing. Thank Thank you so much. This was the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To support the show and to become a part of the Unregistered community, please go to unregisteredlisteners.com. Thanks for listening.